Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. details how advertising through television transforms strangers to your product into acquaintances and acquaintances into friends and friends into customers. You could almost say, as a result, that television puts into every living room a selling machine. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for another episode of Kinescope where we take a look at the era of live television. John Suntress here, Gabriel Hardman here, Jeff Parker here. And I'm really excited about tonight's show because uh, there's a lot of Chicago in this. And it's uh, we're talking about the incredible show, Studs Place. Uh, the great Studs Turkle, the oral historian, for a very brief time, had a television show that originated from Chicago. It was on the NBC network, and then later it was on ABC locally. Uh, but it was a very controversial show because uh, Studs was a controversial guy. Welcome, boys. Hello. Thanks, John. So what? Uh, so uh, what do we think of this actual show? I mean, it's John. Give us a, a description of like how this actually worked. Sure, Studs Place, everybody. Here's the uh, main cast, and uh, Studs Place was this very unique show uh, that was part of the Chicago School of Television. That's what it was called. NBC was looking for cheap fast entertainment and they had three shows in particular that did incredibly well there was the puppet show kukla fan, fan, fan and ollie oh yeah and that was a very big hit also dave garraway who was the original host of the today show had a show uh, prior to the today show called garraway at large and we had studs place studs place took place in chicago at a little diner all dramatized uh but i as, as i've described it this week leading up to tonight's show kind of a combination of cheers and curb your enthusiasm because they would work from a page or a page and a half of plot and the cast improvised their dialogue. They didn't speak extemporaneously. They obviously had rehearsals and things, but um, the cast was left to its own devices to create uh, the dialogue. And it was this really interesting slice of life show that very much was reflective of the 1950s. It was a, a show of the moment, especially when we get into the cast. And uh, it was just, it was weird, but interesting. And it was on late at night. Um, it was on, I believe, at 11 o'clock Chicago time, as as Studs described it. So this is really kind of pre-Tonight uh, Show, uh, Broadway Open House was the big NBC variety show that preceded the Tonight Show. This preceded all of that. And uh, it went out nationally, and it had a little cult following until uh, Studs... Uh, uh, career uh, for lack of a better word as a socialist there is a difference not today for some people that don't understand they're very <laughs> happy to say well if you're a socialist clearly you're a communist and back then uh, studs that uh, faced that problem as did a couple of the other cast members and uh again we'll get into it but uh i think a really really interesting show and this is when tv was experimental and shows like this were experimental 
Yeah, I mean, it's if if they were looking for a fast show, that wasn't this. Uh, this is an unbelievably slow show. I mean, I suppose fast to produce, but uh, but I think in a way that's the value in it. Like uh, there, it's it's an odd thing. It's you know, this is like 1950s, so we're this is the earliest days of you know, of television at all, and so you know these rules haven't been figured out. But it is you know, there's no musical score, and it it just has this sort of uh, at first it it felt like. Am I going to be able to get into this show? Am I going to be able to get through an episode of the show? And yet, what once I got past that a little, you know, that feeling a little bit, like there was something I really enjoyed about the unbelievably low key quality of this show, and uh, and the way that uh, and but it's also a very melancholy show. There's always like some kind of sort of sad conflict at the center of everything that uh, that the you know that, that's that's worked out in some way or another. Uh, I mean, it is a sort of what would become a sitcom formula, you know, yes. later to a large de degree, but not, but, you know, it's not handled in that way. And things could just, you know, we, we'll just come to a stop for somebody to play a song live in the, you know, uh, in the place and, and just, and play that whole song out. And we're not worried about how long it's going to take. And there was something weirdly refreshing to me about that. Well, yeah, that's a, that seems to be the turning point. The, the way uh, through every story is, I don't know, Chet and Wynn, you guys got anything? And then they get over to the piano and then... <laughs> yeah, there are two it's... different regulars who play songs in, in episodes. <laughs> but, and favorites but... with a number and then everything, everybody's happy. But significant guys, I mean, uh, Wynn Win Stacky... Uh... Uh, this guy, it's so fun. I never met Mr. Stacky. I did meet studs. I got a mm -hmm. lot of studs, Sturkel stories. Yeah. Uh, and I'm very, I feel very privileged to have the opportunity in the nineties and early two thousands to have as many studs, Turkle's encounters as I did in my broadcast career. I made a special audio documentary about, uh, the Jack Dempsey, Gene Tunney fight, the rematch, the long count was Dempsey down more than 10 seconds. That was the big controversy. It was one of the biggest, sporting events of the first half of the 20th century studs was 14 in chicago listening to the fight on the radio mm -hmm. and then later on had dempsey had doc kearns dempsey's manager on the show knew the whole score and and got this great teenage perspective from studs and uh so yeah what, a, what an amazing amazing guy but win stacky uh the big guy who was yeah. the folky of the show. Here's a great picture of him eventually. My my computer's being slow with images, everybody. So I'm gonna do my do what I can. Let's see if uh, studs one comes up first. Nope. Uh well, anyway, I'll get uh, hopefully it'll pop on shortly. But Win Stacky, not only a great folky at the uh moment that folk I would say the 50s was the great folk music decade, even though Dylan obviously came later and stuff, but uh and and feel free guys to disagree with me but i just think the time of pete seeger and the weavers and win stacky and stuff win co-founded the old town school of folk music here in chicago which is a very significant both teaching place and musical venue i saw roger mcguinn the lead singer of the birds there uh in the in the 2000s and stuff and we had uh, at my rock station xrt We'd have little shows all the time at the Old Town School of Folk Music. So I didn't realize that uh, that place that really I still live like only 15 minutes away from it. Uh, it's such a significant stage here in Chicago. And when Stacky was the founder of it. And just again, when he would come on and sing these great songs in the episodes and stuff, you know, they, they were amazing. And they were of the time. This was a show of the moment. It really was as far as where I think the culture was in the 1950s. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to disagree with the folk music thing at all. I mean, I think that the, you know, that it, through the 50s, it was about, you know, uh, a, a revival of, you know, traditional songs and the, you know, what you're talking about with Bob Dylan and the the early 60s iteration of, of folk was about, um, you know, uh, kind of taking that and turning it into, uh, you know, writing new songs in that style and, you know, popularizing that, which I think was more, you know, uh, you know, more brought about by that Dylan era than, than this era, which was more about, you know, lit, you know, literally reviving the genre. The, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. And also married to electronic media in a way that obviously pre previous generations couldn't be. So I, right. I think that's another reason why too, that 
uh, music was so important and everything in that era. But it's also very linked to uh, left wing, you know, uh, oh, yeah. politics and left wing oh, causes yeah. and stuff. I mean, you know, even, you know, at all iterations of the, the folk scene. Agreed. Um, God, I'm so glad that we found because initially I was worried that there was only one episode on YouTube. But I guess this Media Burn website actually has several episodes of studs. And we, we all obviously went over there, too. And yeah. checked out. Um, are we, we're still looking at win here. Like, uh, are you still yeah. looking at us again at some point? No, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. <laughs> it's not coming up on my screen. Yeah, no, I kind of thought maybe you weren't seeing that, but from what no, you said, no, when you were clicking back and forth between them, we were seeing, you know, uh, we saw studs, we saw win. So, you know, I love his again. voice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, studs prior to TV, uh, studs really broke through in electronic media both as a DJ, but also his real big break initially was he was a radio actor on the soap operas because Chicago was kind of the hub for a lot of the most popular network soap operas, both for CBS and NBC, pre-ABC's existence. And uh, he was on Ma Perkins, and he, because of that voice, uh, you can't help it, he was a gangster. He was always a gangster. Right. So, and then it kind of worked. I mean, that's, you, you kind of you kind of got it and everything. So, yeah, I love studs. I mean, you know, but go on, keep talking. Jeff, what were you saying? Oh, well, we could mention the, the the one that we told everybody to watch, which was the Jimmy Comes Home uh, episode, which then we found uh, another episode with the exact same plot, except Studs is the a-hole. Yeah. Because uh, Studs meets an opera singer, and then he really wants to impress him, and he's telling everybody, uh, can you guys go away, you commoners? For uh, You know, I'm talking big talk. And of course, the guy's super impressed with uh, Wynn and Chet doing what they do. And the same thing happens with it's Jimmy, right? Wasn't it Jimmy? Uh, yeah, that's right. He, he's all excited. It's funny because looking at it through a modern lens, I, I'm immediately going, immediately like getting it all wrong, going, well, this is really progressive. Like the guy goes off to college, realizes he's gay, he meets this yeah, guy, I know. And he wants to bring him back. Hundred percent. Like I, yeah. it was impossible <laughs> to watch the episode without without thinking yeah, that. He, like he's, impossible. He's so into it, and the way he reacts and is all over him. And you're like, wow, they're really progressive here. And then I'm like, no, no, no. They're they're actually just I, playing. Of course it. not. Like, but you could change absolutely zero about this episode, about that episode, except except say, you know, like at you know when you when you show it to somebody, say that it's about that, that that's what it's about, and it would play that way and not yeah. in a bad way at all. Yeah. No, no, it works. It works totally. He's embarrassed at his Italian heritage uh, and all this stuff. He's come oh yeah they're really good we'll, we'll um, get to it well and i apologize guys again i'm 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 not seeing what you guys are saying so you'll forgive me if uh, they pop up in an opportune moments i'll try not to do that okay the uh but yeah so anyway the guy's gone off to college for a, a year he comes back and he's got a friend who's going to meet him he's deathly in and he's gay and he's he really wants to impress him <laughs> You know, he's clearly in love with this guy, but he, you know, he's just, um, he yeah, wants I'm not accepting him. the version where, where they're not gay. Okay. I mean, I'm no, sorry, no. but it just yeah, plays too well. well that way. I don't like it as a class thing. It's, it's yeah. better as a, it's better as a, a crush. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the guy comes in and of course he loves studs plays. He loves the whole gang. They, they start to sing. He's really enjoying it. And then, the guy has to rediscover his own past and that, you know, he's not uh, anything to be ashamed of. He doesn't have yeah. to hide who he is. You know, come on now. The, uh, <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah. oh, they, they do do a couple of cool Italian things. And uh, then when sings Aria and uh, it's really good stuff. There he is. Yeah, um, I mean, although just like pacing was and everything, I actually kind of liked some of the other episodes better the uh, of, of the ones that we saw. Uh, the you know where my um, favorite was arthritis. Uh, arthritis, where, yeah, and the yeah. Christmas episode, right? Yeah, uh, that is the it? Christmas yes. episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't, and, I never liked the Christmas episode, but I thought that one worked really well. You know, weirdly, uh, it, it's you know, uh, it had it's Tim O'Connor, right? And right, uh, character actor. Uh, people will remember him from. The old Buck Rogers show. He was Doctor Hewer. Yeah, uh, he was a recurring. He was not Tweaky. On, 
He was not, oh, not uh, Doctor Theopolis. No, he right. was Neither Hewer. of those. Yeah. No, he was Doctor Hewer. Yes, Buck, I'm uh, sending you to uh, New Houston uh, for uh, an oil refinery. Yeah, whatever. He's kind of a he's kind of a poor man's James Mason. Yes. Well, and he was he's Basil Exposition. You know, I mean, he yeah. really is like kind of the guy that would explain the scenarios. But it's great to see him in stud yeah. place here as this young uh, guy who yeah, he's uh, good. who yeah. you know kind of tries to con. Uh, the group into giving him 50 bucks so uh, he can get to New York. And again, it's so of the moment. I, I now I'm blanking on who the uh, band was that he claimed. I think it's Woody Herman, right? I think you're right. Yeah. And right. Uh, so he, he, you know, uh, Tim O'Connor is a sort of, you know, hip jazz musician who was, he was in the war. He says he stayed in Europe longer afterwards. He, you know, uh, and he, around, um, you know, uh, and, and Chet knows him. Yeah, that knows him. Yeah, and uh, you know he, he comes back, and then then you know it's they they start to suspect something's up with him. Turns out that uh, you know the telegram he shows them uh, where Woody Herman is in, inviting him to come uh, come to New York and play with him was actually from a couple of years before, and uh, he uh, and but uh, he's unable to he can't play anymore. Like the crux of it is that you know they they think he's somehow a fraud, but in, in reality he's. Uh, He's developed arthritis and is in you know is unable to play anymore. So he's uh, he's he's actually going to you know kind of like take a fifty dollar a week teaching gig where they can just sort of exploit his name you know to to bring in students. But uh, the but one one of the things about this is you know I mean obviously Stud Circle is known for his kind of left wing politics and stuff and it's not it's not really overt exactly but the um but there's a sort of deep humanism in in these you know there there it, it a lot of like empathy towards people and you know lack I mean for for what's always set up as judging somebody is off it, it you know is never paid off that way uh it's you know there there's just a very human quality to the show that I really enjoy well, like Studs himself described, and I'm so glad that um, that uh, Jeff found that documentary at this Media Burn website, where it also it shows an episode, but there's a great wraparound of of Studs, and also on that site there are interviews with Studs about the show, and he's like he really pegs everybody on the show. When was the folky? Chet was the bebop jazz pianist. By the way, uh, actually a uh, jazz pianist of note. Ed asked earlier, you know, was the music any good? Here's Chet on the uh, on the cover, uh, Chet Robel on the cover of Downbeat, uh, this very cool uh, jazz magazine and stuff. And yeah, and I also found other uh, local shows where Chet was there as kind of the the piano accompanist. It's kind of a Paul Schaefer of his day, but just like Paul Schaefer, a hell of a studio mus musician beyond being funny on camera and stuff. And yeah, and also just, I love that, they all speak in um, that great kind of uh, bebop and beatnik and bohemian. He, he especially does, yeah. Yeah, and I mean that's the thing, man. These guys are these guys are the real McCoy and and the woman as well. And I'm sorry, I'm bringing up. I want to bring up uh, her name properly. Um, Beverly Younger. Yeah. Who, uh, uh, Gabe? Did you look up her uh, IMDb at all? Uh, I did not actually. Um... Beverly Younger. She didn't make a lot of movies, but she made one big significant movie. Makes oh, sense. In, it was it was shot during the uh, Chicago. Uh, yeah, yeah, medium cool. Uh, medium cool yeah, everybody. yeah. She's interesting. Haskell Wexler's, uh, you know, like <laughs> semi verite uh, masterpiece uh, shot during the uh, uh, with Robert Forrester. Uh, and, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I, I actually, I, I, I wish I had t taken a look back at that. It's it's pretty amazing that Beverly Younger was in the cast. She's the only one that plays a role because Studs is Studs, Wynn is Wynn, Chet is Chet, right. and yeah. Beverly is Gracie, the waitress. And also, I think, a pretty progressive character for uh, for the times and just a good kind of wise-ass, didn't take any shit from, from, any, from either of the three. And really held her own. And that, again, I really, the arthritis episode really was my favorite of the ones that we watched. Of course, and that yeah, one, me too. She's, yeah. she's the hard ass who, like, uh, it's, you make money, you got to save it. And, you know, she's, yeah. she's yeah. getting in some of the thing, like, uh, against the the kid. Um, but a very significant actress here. Here's her uh, her uh, obituary by Rich Kogan. Rich Kogan, a great Chicago newsman. And, um, 
God, she really was like this very accomplished actress for staying within the Chicago circle. Very big in live theater locally. Uh, lived a nice full life. Died in Evanston, another uh, the Northwestern uh, uh, home uh, for Northern nice area. suburbs of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Very and again, I think all four of these people incredibly interesting careers uh, beyond the show. And then the end of the episode, uh, like after the guys fessed up and everything, Studs uh, goes ahead and gives him the money anyway. Yeah, and then they kick in a little more, and then he pulls out a p piece of paper from the trash can that was like a thing looking <laughs> for money earlier, and it was about arthritis. So they put a couple of bucks in that. And it's like, and this is all very, uh, uh, really putting himself out because as far as I can tell, Studs Place has no customers. Yes, they, <laughs> it's true. I can't imagine any of these people ever pay. I mean, uh, no one else ever pay. comes in, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, if they, if they, if they're coming in, it's just, I mean, there's, there was the one with the traveling salesman. I don't know if you watched the card shark one. Uh, uh, where where uh, where there was a traveling salesman who actually like ordered some food and presumably oh, wow. paid for it, although uh, you know it turned into a whole thing because they 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 became convinced that uh, he was uh, you know he was there to hustle them with cards, but uh, and so they they thought they would preemptively hustle him, uh, and, you know, in order to uh, um, <laughs> you know in order to not get taken, uh, but then uh, he uh, you know he 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 caught on to their hustle. He called the police on them and, uh, you know, and uh, the, you know, and the, the cop comes in to, you know, and, and he accuses this of being a gambling joint, you know, and uh, and they're totally guilty, though. That's the best part about it. Right. It's not really a misunderstanding. They're guilty. They they did try to hustle this guy. They yeah. marked a card. They did like they did. <laughs> they did everything wrong. Right. And, you know, and ultimately they. You know, she has to, uh, you know, the waitress has to kind of, right. you know, ex explain, no, look, they're schmucks. They just got, they got, they got overexcited about this whole thing, you know, and uh, they gave the guy his money back and everything was fine. But, uh, it, but I believe that guy may have at least, you know, paid for a cup of coffee and a sink. So that's where that 50 bucks came from is that yes. one guy. <laughs> yes. The one paying customer they've ever had. Well, the great thing is uh, uh, Jeff pointed us to a return to Studs Place, early 60s, yeah, kind of retrospective, for lack of a better word, where they show an episode in the middle. But they're at the place, and it's just as abandoned as a former place yeah. as it was when it was an active place. Nobody's yeah, there. Like right, I love the world. I know. I it, yes, it does. There is a sort of post-apocalyptic feel about that. But it's funny that the, you know, that they didn't go, oh, hey, you know, studs and the gang have been hanging out here, like doing, you know, uh, you know, having their, you know, their little adventures th this entire time. And we're just catching up with them. It's like, oh, you know, look, oh, look, the old place is falling down and it's a you know but look there's the piano it's still there and then everybody comes <laughs> around June, and then, like the last 10 minutes of it they're just just trying to decide where they're going to go out for dinner but it's great i don't know i i really yeah, how they I, even I, get in the building yeah, yeah. I, find, I found it very charming <laughs> if they and if they so, did that with cheers now where everybody just showed up in the shambles of the bar yeah. or whatever <laughs> boy fans would be so mad yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's as Studs described it they, again. They would only have like a page or maybe a page and a half of a plot, and they would just all go around and kind of, all right, let's do this, let's do that. And they also said that surprisingly, for being so improvisational, um, the show ended on time, and uh, you know they would have to right. cut the other thing. And it's like we never went late, we never we never went long. We we just seemed to instinctive. I mean, and again. Maybe they had to have rehearsed magic. this, though. Well, it's, they, not, no, no, no. it's not that shaggy of improv, he, right? It, he yeah. said, he absolutely said in other interviews, look, I'm not saying that we came up with dialogue spur of the moment. He right. said, but we really worked from this page and a half, and the the actors were allowed to kind of create their own dialogue. I mean, it's no different and there, than what we see in Curb, frankly. And there's a big card at the end of the episodes that say that the cat, you know, dialogue by the cast. Yes, yes. So it's and even in that it. even in that return to Stubbs Place as they were trying to figure out where to eat, it's like this is such a Chicago show. I mean, anyone from here that grew up here and stuff, even now oh, do people in Chicago eat? Yeah. Oh yeah. 
<laughs> oh no, it's a good people. Oh, other places eat as well, John. No, like it's point, possible to have no, this kind hey, of conversation. My, other places. my point is that the ethnicities of the places they all describe, they're describing Chicago. Sure. sure so sure. I don't know how many Polish places there are in in uh, your neck of the world. Oh no, look. No, I'm, you gotta I'm, go to, go to the Ukrainian places. Yeah. I'm a I'm a pierogi fan. This there is you go. Man. You know, I That's what like, I'm saying. Uh, this is one of the only foods that I'll go out of my way for. So look, <laughs> don't don't hassle me about this. No, no, and, I, and truly, I mean that's and they're and they're citing the right neighborhood. It's Milwaukee Avenue. It's like you're goddamn right. And even now, I mean, because a lot obviously this was 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Excuse me. Uh, but even now, there are still little mom and pop joints, thankfully, in a lot of pockets of Chicago that reflect the character of what is described in Studs Place. And that's so great to see. And it was so, again, this is before uh, really the encroachment of, of Los Angeles television on a national scale. Because really once LA was up and running with the, what, the coaxial cable that connected the two coasts and everything, uh, they, they leaned hard on Chicago just as they did in the radio days, in these early days of television. Philadelphia also a major hub for uh, local TV that made it nationally, or what counted as national. John, and, would would every single corner absolutely have an old style beer sign on it? Uh, even then, uh, Jeff, uh, a Starbucks just closed that is walking distance from me. That is, it's not, um, it's not that brewer. It's a, it's a former Schlitz uh, bar bar slash brew house. And it's a historical landmark, and I can't wait to see what's going to move in there. Mm. I'm really bummed because it was kind of lovely that they were still brewing. They were just brewing coffee instead of beer at the place. It was pretty mm -hmm. cool. Mm. I, so the the local version of the show, though, it was really short-lived, right? I mean, it yes. ran from April to August or something. It was not a, you know, it, it didn't last a really long time. No. And then there was the sort of quasi-network, ABC network version of it, but that was wasn't that just to it was like sold in such a way where like a co-op situation where lo, you know it where local uh, advertisers could advertise it on it but this show yeah. was never able to pick up a, a national you know uh sponsor the way that they you know that a network show would need to well and to even uh, I, I believe it was the arthritis episode had uh, this uh a public service message and maybe uh in lieu of that, local stations might have played something yeah, yeah I think that's right. it's yeah. a it's an iron scrap iron kind of psa of right. hey uh, you know the military complex needs tanks and guns right so uh, get, get, get rid of your hard metal and give right. it to the government because we need weapons <laughs> now <laughs> frank capra would have had a kid with a wagon pulling a bunch of metal down the street yeah like in getting why we and fight they but only again, had the they only had the budget they only had the budget for a really disturbing bumper. They didn't have uh, <laughs> with this metal eaten robot guy. Uh, yeah. the, but uh, the, me. yeah, because you gotta you know look the Korean conflict is going on. We gotta exactly you know, man. <laughs> gotta keep those commies down. We need your we need your metal and we need it now. Yeah. So and I and I can only imagine what studs because again studs as he described himself. Back when he was a kid and as he was growing up, he's like, I signed every petition because I was for the working man. Yeah. And he goes, and the working man was screwed. And I saw it firsthand. His uh, his father and then his mother ran a men's only hotel, kind of those gross little places like you see in the Blues Brothers first movie back in 79. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's kind of where Studs got his street education was living in that. When you mentioned the local or, uh, sponsorships, there was a Chicago coffee company called Manor House, and they were a big sponsor for the show. And, and you know, whatever. And um, sometimes, and although I, I didn't see it in the examples that we watched, they would integrate the commercial into the dialogue of the show. And one time it was uh, Chet's responsibility to uh, do the commercial. And he went up on his lines and instead of saying Manor House, he said Maxwell House. <laughs> and this was in the middle of the show. And Studs is like, God, he goes, you just felt Chet's like failure and that he just wanted to inch away and like leave the stage immediately. And he goes, so is as much just doing our dialogue, but also kind of just letting him know it's all right. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. 
<laughs> and apparently, again, this is in the innocent days. Manor House is like, all right, he made a mistake. Whatever. We're not going to drop you. Don't worry. We'll right. drop well, you. Well, eight people were watching. So well, they, they just went around to their houses and told them, you know, yeah. and reminded them. Hey, we're that. sorry. It was Manor yeah. House. Yeah, yeah. Drink this. Okay. Yeah. Studs was a, seriously Studs was so cool, and the he had the I mean what a rack on tour and there thank God there are so many great examples of Studs on YouTube doing uh, interviews late in his life and God I told you guys last week when we were talking off the air we had him on our sports talk station he had just released a book called The Spectator one of his oral history books his great book is working everybody if you don't know yeah. and i can't recommend it enough because it really is as the title suggests a wonderful look at the working class and you're ta he's talking to truck drivers and waitresses and they all have compelling stories and again that's he's he is truly one of my interview gods he always was and to even have the few encounters that i had over my broadcast career it's like I'm in the presence of greatness. Thank God the man is willing to talk to me. He couldn't have been sweeter. Uh, but he he lived right by Lake Michigan in a very affluent, gated community. But one night uh, when he was in his 80s, I don't mean to laugh, but I just know where the story is going. Uh, a guy broke into his house and wanted to, you know, and he Studs was there. His, he lived with his son. Son wasn't there at the time, just Studs. And the guy, like he had maybe $100 in cash in the house. So the guy's leaving, and Studs goes, hey, you're going to leave me like 20 bucks, right? And the guy's like, what? And he goes, come on, I'm an old man. I got to be able to take a cab to the bank tomorrow and stuff. You're not going to strand me here in my own house, are you? The guy left him 20 bucks, and then he left. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I love about And I don't know if that's, that's right. or not, but it's a pure, it's a, such a perfect Studs well, See, somewhere I read one where he's mugged, like Studs is just constantly mugged or, or, or whatever, and then ask for, like, leaving bus fare so he can get back home. And oh, didn't okay. actually say whether he did, you know, it's like, I like thinking studs was constantly being stolen from and, and negotiating some of his money back. Nothing phased the guy. The, he saw it all. He, I mean, when we had him in studio at the radio station and I told you guys, some guys, like, I can't believe you have this communist. I was like, ah, oh, shut up. And we're like, shut <laughs> up. Leave him alone. We're like, we love studs. Like the guy is like literally in a national institution. It's like, having Lincoln or Carl Sandburg on your radio stage. I mean, that's the greatness of Stud Sterkel. And thank it's God. Like, it's like the Sears Tower walked into your building and did a show. <laughs> For real, man. And I love that. Uh, I mean, really, he had a great show in the 70s. He was part of a show called The Great American Dream Machine that was on public television. Public television knew exactly what they had with Stud Sterkel. And yeah. the word got around. And and uh, I'm really happy that... Uh, his senior years were as comfortable as they were for him. And also, I mean, he was, he had an office at the Chicago uh, history museum. Oh, cool. and, and when I, when I wanted to book him for the Dempsey Tunney thing, they're like, Oh, he's never here. Like go to his house, go to his house. And he's like, yeah, come on over. So I did his, his, he's in his eighties, his 60 something son answers the door. And they, they, they had me a vodka and cranberry. You drink? I'm like, sure. I and I walk in, it. I walk in He's got a giant model of like, it looks like a freighter ship. It's not like a tall sails kind of ship. It really is kind of an industrial kind of giant ship. And I'm like, oh, you make models? He's like, no, no, no. That was a birthday present from Kurt Vonnegut. It's supposed to be the Titanic. I was born the year that the Titanic sank. And I'm like, of course you were. And of course, <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut bought this for you. That's fantastic. So, I mean, just, just crazy shit like that. I mean, That's he was... Awesome. He was delightful. He really was. He was an amazing guy. I like thinking he'd just show up and he'd offer you a Cape Cod right off the bat as soon as you walk <laughs> in. That's pretty great. You drink? Yes, I do. And great. We're all having we're all having Cape Cod. Sit down. Sure. <laughs> Tell me about Dempsey Tunney. I'd be glad to. Sweet as hell. So much fun. So That's and I great. have that I have that documentary on the word balloon feed. So if anyone's curious. Oh, okay. Great. Oh, great. Yeah. I, 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 I wish I still like had that. the raw interview because he just oh, yeah he's so he was so extent in that capacity as an interview guest he was a wordsmith i mean it was word jazz he really he uh ken nordin the man who created word jazz uh, studs again he was just this man of of the 40s and 50s and would just he spoke like a poet he really did he was just this really he wasn't a beat he was too old to be i think considered a beat generation guy 
but he certainly, you know, spoke the language and, and was of the moment. So, yeah, I don't know how the other if he's considered a beat or not. I don't. Believe no, well, I mean, he was he would have been in his forties yeah, in the in the fifties. Yeah, so he went to yeah, college yeah. in the thirties. So yeah, yeah. Well, he was born in nineteen twelve, right? So uh, fourteen. Four. Okay. Wait. Um, if I got Titanic wrong, I'm sorry. When did the Titanic go down? I thought 1911. Okay, fine. <laughs> Close enough. Here, Don Lenzo, when he talked about Babe Ruth, he said it doesn't matter if, oh, about Babe calling the shot. It doesn't matter if it's a lie or a truth. He said the true stories were more amazing than the lies. Yeah, you know, well, as as we know uh, from our uh, recurring uh, Liberty Valance theme, uh, print the legend. Yeah. When, you know, and then that's fine. No, Studs, Studs was amazing. And yeah, Ed asked if... Uh, Studs was a legit, authentic, seen it all, been there, done that type of guy. Or was he more of a BS artist? No, no, no. He was he was the real McCoy. He was he was absolutely legit. Saw it all, did it all. Incredible interviewer. Their um, uh, public radio has been amassing this Studs Turkle archive where they went and they did. They've been digitizing <clears throat> all the real to real interviews that he did. And as a kid, when I was fourteen, I had a a really fun high school elective uh, called broadcast journalism. And they took us on a tour of all the radio stations in the city. And we went to uh, WFMT, which is the classical music station still is public radio station. They would break for an hour from the classical music and studs would do a show. And he, they also did other, they did a folk show and a few other, pardon me, a few other things, but we actually got to watch uh, from another studio studs through the window conducting one of his interviews and the guy was just amazing and as i told you guys i mean literally from buckminster fuller and mahalia jackson to laurie anderson when oh superman first was out lou reed's uh, widow and amazing performance artist uh, herself yeah i mean ed studs was very comfortable uh, there's a great digitized interview with him with janice joplin right after a concert here in chicago i mean again the guy was just comfortable talking to everybody and just I had another great one, Arthur. C, he had Arthur C. Clarke on mm. the 2001. Uh, our, uh, man, of course, amazing, both factual and uh, science fiction uh, writer um, in the early 60s. And they were talking about the space race. And again, all we had done is orbit the Earth. And he's like, well, if we make it to the other planets and if there is an Earth like atmosphere. And they were just kind of postulating what might be out there when there were still a lot of unknowns about outer space. And it's, I mean, it's a lot of it's wrong, but it's fascinating to hear. And again, I mean, he just, he, he, he could change gears on subjects so easily and just was an expert of everything or innately curious enough to have an intelligent conversation. Yeah. What right. about these other planets? They got working Joe's there working stiff. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I want to find the uh, wind uh, stacky of, uh, of yeah. things, please. Absolutely. I'm going to go there. And if they're in trouble, maybe I'll give them 50 bucks. Yeah. There he is. He is his. <laughs> and I do. And I love the music. I really do love. Yeah. When Chet would just Chet would just get behind the piano and rip something off on the piano. And uh, when I would end with one of his, uh, folky tomes that really were somber he had that great bass voice yeah his, his super deep voice is it's a pleasure to hear and it, i love the fact that they're apparently also just on salary there uh though there are never any other customers you know there it's like yeah it's true just, it's like they they have this place just, really values having live entertainment yeah, live entertainment, it, but you know, well, well, isn't it? Wind is supposed to go like, uh, you know, clean up the, you know, uh, you know, clear the snow out of the alley yeah. and shit like that too, right? Yeah, and sometimes a cook pops out. Yeah, yes, and then on that, some episode, some episode, uh, the the college kid Jimmy pops back in, and he's suddenly working there. You know, he's uh, it's like he he comes back a few times, I think. I love how they have these portraits of Abe Lincoln in the back too. Because again, right by where I live, very a great, there's a Lincoln Diner, and it has the kind of same setup, and it is one of these old timey diners and stuff that that absolutely, it's like no man, this is the way it's looked for the last sixty years, <laughs> and that's why it's like no, this is so. Again, I understand there are other diners in other cities. I think you, I think New York, talking with you, John. I know, I, you. No, I but and I, I New York has a few. The yes. Chicago ness of it is a, a huge part of what makes it interesting. I mean, the the fact yeah. I don't think that. 
if the show was, you know, if it were a network show, if it were something that came out of New York or God forbid, Los Angeles, it would, there's no way that it would have this kind of tone to it. It would not, you know, it would not have been allowed to be this odd low key yeah. show that just develops the way that it does. I mean, I mean, th this is very much the nascent early days of this stuff of, of live television. So it wasn't like it was all figured out, but it, and, you know, and it is shot like, you know, uh, you know, there, there's nothing, you know, impressive about the way it's shot. It is on a stage with, you know, seemingly two cameras and, you know, oh, uh, only, only, I bet there were only two cameras, you I know, think, right? if that, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. and, uh, you know, yeah. very, you know, very staid, but, um, and to some extent, that's probably because they didn't, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure they rehearsed this, but I doubt they camera blocked it that tightly. Right. Like, so you're you're kind of, you know, just having to capture it. And well, uh, I, I wonder if you guys had the same feeling having watched uh, the front before the Woody Allen film. Yeah. When um, we see um, Zero Mostel's live TV show where he's kind of this you know, the railroad kind of guy. Oh, kind yeah, of, right, right. It, it, I really feel, even though it's a different setting and all that, it has that same vibe, I think, as Studs Place. At least that that's how I... Well, I mean, I it, and it, it. that, you know, that certainly may have been an inspiration for that since the whole gist of the, you know, the Zero Mostel part is that he, you know, he's, you know... Blacklisted. Yeah, he's blacklisted. He's considered red. He's, you know, uh, and, you know, Studs Terkel talks about... I mean, it, the show seemingly didn't didn't go anywhere because it had no sponsor and and a limited audience but it but he also says you know that you know that it was to a degree because he was kind of blacklisted because he yeah. you know because of his views on stuff and and certainly you could see how it's not it, unlike i love lucy or something this is you know we're you know you it's it's not political but it's definitely wearing those intentions on its sleeve 100 percent. well and studs himself said that NBC gave him a chance, and they're like, "Listen, it was you signed all these petitions. You did it when you were young. Just make a statement that you were young and foolish, and this will go away." And he's like, "No, right? No, right. I'm yeah. not going to do that." And again, yeah. I mean, I mean, it kind of slid his own television throat. I don't know how much longer Studs would have survived, given where television went, because again, he and he always said this about studs place itself he goes it wasn't theater and it wasn't film if this yeah, really had to be something unique and it's right so it and it's, it's, the, it's also not really his mood anyway he's he's radio he's right. he's audio yeah. he's audio and yeah. and writing and and like as a tv guy he's the least charismatic person on the show yeah yeah i mean and he, but he also didn't you know i mean it's also the part a little bit like it's you yeah. know he's his part on the show is a little bit like uh you know he's sort of the uh, you know everybody sort of revolves around or whatever he's not really the focal point of the show in a lot of ways but um you know but i think that it's not irrelevant that the, the part where they didn't have a sponsor because if they had a sponsor, the show probably wouldn't have been what it was, right? It, there would be somebody else there saying, "We get this, you know, this needs to move faster. We need to have, you know, uh, you know, we whatever they would want, you know." Uh, and so, you know, it didn't it didn't come under that influence the way that other shows did. It is amazing that literally right after Studs Place, he went to WFMT and st really started doing his radio interview uh, career. And he went from 1952 to 1997. It's nuts. Yeah. Not yeah. 45 yeah. years, man. 45 <laughs> years. You got to love that. And he didn't even write the first book until like 67, right? Uh, the first Working? of the oral history books. I don't oh. know if that was the first one or not, but it, I at least I read that he was 55 before he actually, you know, uh, well, had the first he book. Is, yeah. His first book was called Giants his of Jazz. First book was the jazz book, but I mean the first of 67. those kind of, yeah. Yes, yeah. 67 yeah. is his first oral history book. Right. Yes. And um, and again, I mean, I um, we had him on the score, and I went to a book signing for his book in the 90s called The Spectator, and he signed a book to me, and, he, and he's like, to John, a fellow broadcaster, and it's like, oh, that means a lot, man. You're letting me in the club. Thank you, man. Yeah. So yeah, he was, also, he was. I mean, is it not just cool that he started like another career when he was fifty-five, where you know, with writing yeah. these oral history books, right? I mean, like, 
you know. No, he's amazing. He's in Eight Men Out. He's one mm-hmm. of the reporters in John Sayles' movie, and I love mm-hmm. that because it's kind of perfect that he he should be in there. I was so surprised that he wasn't more into boxing, but another great Chicago literary man, Nelson Algren, City on the Make, uh, got him. He's like, I went a, I went a few times with Nelson. Nelson's your boxing guy. It's a shame you didn't get to meet him. So I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes, sir. You know, <laughs> and that's truly, man. Listen, and I know, I, I just like, I, I, I think they say it on West Wing. What is it about guys from Chicago? They can't wait to tell you. Hey, I'm from Chicago. Let me tell you about Chicago. We're very proud of the city, but I am really proud of the literary history that that the city represents, the the improvisational theater that uh, the city represents, and and you really get this great kind of and and the jazz and the I, folk music, and it all comes together in Studs Place. In it's that, got a in, river that runs backward. It's got it all. <laughs> In the uh, in in the return to Studs place, does, is it Win or somebody comes in and says that he's working up Second City, right? Like uh, that, that's a line. Yeah. 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 No, again, man, this is this is what you love, and and again, I just love that Win really was a legit, and you can find examples of his folk music. And uh, I was looking really hard for some uh, jazz from Chet, and it's tough to find. But again, I mean, the guy was big enough that uh, they threw him on the cover of Downbeat which is no small achievement, especially back then when jazz was so important. Sure. Um, yeah. And again, uh, uh, Beverly Younger, just so, so terrific. And, and really uh, I haven't, I did not watch medium cool again prior to this. I am curious to look back and see her performance because again, that, that wonderful obituary that Rich Kogan wrote, and you can find it online. Uh, it, it really is a great tribute and it's kind of a full page acknowledgement of her theatrical greatness that's what i mean man it's just this i think it's such a cool show that all these interesting people got together and made this thing for a couple of years yeah i agree i agree yeah and it just has this it and that's exactly what it feels like it feels i mean and look the one thing we haven't really talked about are the behind the scenes people like studs turkle didn't write this show the i mean you know it wasn't written written anyway but like uh, and uh, I found uh, next to no information about the behind-the-scenes people uh, like this show. Part. So, I, I mean, if John, if you have anything, but uh, but yeah. you know, it's a, it's sort of obscure shit, you know. Well, I mean, there's yeah. on IMDb it credits like a a producer is Daniel Petri, Petri, who is a you know who went on to be have a directing career. His son is a big deal in the you know uh, uh, writers guild and stuff. But, but you know, uh, like it's uh, but I don't I don't really I didn't find a lot about it but the technical stuff and behind the scenes and you know who actually made it well again in the credits and forgive me i didn't i didn't uh write down but you could see in that menu credits that they do they say who the co-creator of the show was right right and, but and it, in these subsequent interviews stud said he and the co-creator would just kind of be okay this is the plot this week they'd come up with like a page maybe a page and a half and um then they would the four the four principals would discuss it Right. And, it's credit uh, Charlie Andrews is who uh, the uh, is credited to as the creator. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't but have, I'm just I saying there wasn't them. a lot. I couldn't find a lot on these people or what you know what else. Well, you know they would have uh, done as, or what happened. As, to, you know, as Stud said himself in in subsequent interviews, Charlie Andrews was also responsible for writing Dave Garraway's Garraway at Large, and right. um and that's the thing. So really, it was these three shows: Garraway at Large, Stud's Place, and Kukla Fran and Ollie. And man. Uh, you want to hear, uh, and I know he had him several times on his radio show, the level of respect that Studs had for Burr Tilstrom. Not Bert, Burr, like Raymond Burr. That was his first name. This guy was a genius. And really, yeah, Kukla Fran, Fran and Ollie was a kid's show. But like a lot of like Bo Winkle and even I hope we get to uh, Time for Beanie, Beanie and Cecil. There's a lot of fun, subversive kind of comments on society that Bert Pilstrom put in Kukla Fran and Ollie. And mm-hmm. again, I mean, even just Stud's level of, of again, respect for Burr. He's like, they, they, they're just these little mitts that are on his hands and they become characters. And he, he talked about being on um, Kukla Fran and Ollie and they had a character that was like this. A rich dowager woman that was a, a patron of the theater, and of course she saw Carmen and everything. And he's like, I found myself having real conversations with the sock on his hand <laughs> and treating it very seriously. And then you know, Bert Tilstrom's like, you know, uh, my papa would love to be, you know, whatever her name was, would love to be on on Studs Place. He goes, I was over the moon. He goes, Yes, please, let's do an episode with her. 
crazy shit. I mean, <laughs> and again, I, and that's what I love. And again, it was just this great, like, NBC, like, all right, we got to fill the hours. Uh, you guys come up with something from Chicago, but make it cheap. Right. No problem. And right. do what you want, but make it cheap. Dave Garraway became a huge star, becomes the, the, the first host of the Today Show, played by Barry Levinson in the uh, quiz show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I think very uh, adeptly. And Bert Tilstrom, Kukla Fran and Ali, beyond its initial 50s run, came back so many times in the 60s and into the 70s and Christmas specials in the 80s. I mean, as long as Mr. Tilstrom was alive, uh, he was cranking out uh, shows for public television. And just a just a genius. So all three of them just genius. And look how much stuff you know uh, ha that that has come down through time that we remember that's been important and influential was made because somebody was like, "We're not going to tell you what to do. We don't really know. We don't care as long as you do it cheaply." You just know, like stuff. that. Like you know, some of the most important stuff has happened that way. Where yeah, you don't get to spend a lot of money, but nobody's telling you what to do, so you get to go out on a limb and take a chance. Yeah, man. Well, again, I you know I just talked a couple of weeks ago to uh, Dave Thomas from SCTV, and you go back to the half hour syndicated show, and he's like, "Yeah, we had no budget. We'd go to Woolworths, the dime store, not the dollar yeah. store. This is back back in the seventies, yeah. the dime store. Yeah, to buy to buy stuff to, to for props and and ideas for sketches and stuff. Or you and know, again, I mean, to tying to together the, the puppets and stuff as well. Mystery Science Theater three thousand. I mean, it absolutely. started off as absolutely nothing. You know, yeah. absolutely. Yep. So, yeah, so that's Studs Place, everybody. Go to um, Media Burn. Is that what it's called? Media Burn is what it's called. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, really, if you just search for uh, Studs Place and, uh, you know, uh, you it'll come up as one of the videos. And, and you go to the Media Burn site and there's like eight or so episodes of it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Worth checking out. Definitely. 100%, man. No, it really is an interesting, interesting show. And it's a great showcase for Mr. Turkle. And what he represented. And I think you really will uh, come away with it with a real appreciation. And especially if you know the backstories of Chet and Wynn and, uh, and Beverly Younger as Grace. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah. So there you go. Cool. So uh, next week on the show, uh, we're going to cover the Studio One adaptation of uh, Orwell, Orwell's 1984. So, uh, you know, we'll, uh, you know, there'll be presumably a lot of talk of other, uh, you know, adaptations of 1984 and, uh, you know, a very know, Chicago based sort of, uh, thing. <laughs> and, uh, Eddie Albert, know, Lisa, Eddie, exactly. Yeah. Uh, starring Eddie Albert and Lauren Green. So, uh, you Come know, on. we'll see how that goes. You got it. You got to come just for that, man. Are you kidding yeah. me? That's awesome. I love oh. Eddie Albert, man. He's, I, I've always liked him. Oh, so obviously we're going to spend like 45 minutes of it talking about Green Acres, whatever. It's fine. I got no we all love Green Acres. I, uh, we can also talk about McHugh, where yes. <laughs> or he's, longest yard. He, he's brought yeah the longest yard. He's he's the he's, asshole warden. Yeah, come it, on. You're like whenever there's an older uh, uh, lead, and they want to make him seem younger, like with John Wayne, they bring in Eddie Albert, like <laughs> his white hair, to try to make John Wayne seem youth, youthful. Right. Come on, the I'm case, 51. Sure you are, Duke. Well, next to Eddie Albert, I look 51. Okay, Duke. No problem. Absolutely. You're hilarious. <laughs> That's so true. I just love where Eddie Albert's career went. But also, it's funny. Oh, I, yeah. This week, I was watching uh, a history of the Desilu Studios because I'm anticipating this Nicole Kidman, Javier Bardem uh, movie about Lucy and Desi. The, the pain right. and embarrassment that will be that miniature. Uh, but go ahead. I hope that it surprises everybody, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, but regardless, uh, Eddie Albert did a pre I Love Lucy RKO film, uh, romantic, romantic comedy with Lucy. And he had great memories of, of Lucy, you know. And, and everyone forgets, man, like Lucy was a bombshell before I Love Lucy and she's wacky Lucy and stuff. She was really like a lovely romantic lead. She made, as you know, uh, Gabe, being the noir fan that you are, was it Dark Corner or Dark? Yeah, Dark Corner. Yeah, I think so. I think Douglas Sirk directed that. Around then, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. There's also, a, and I can't remember which one it was because there's a billion of them. But <clears throat> there was a Three Stooges uh, short, the football she, one. Yeah, she pops up in. Yeah, like, man, it's like looking into the sun. She is just blowing people off the stage. It's really yeah. something. 
So I hope that I just hope that everybody out there uh, who, if if you're still uh, listening to this or watching this, Why is appreciating the fact that you're just hearing the part that happens after the show yeah. at this point, right? This is just what yeah, we, we talk about going. once we stop, right? We just forgot to stop. That's true. <laughs> All right, fair enough. That's a hint from Gabe. He's throwing down the flag. <laughs> we will stop talking. Line. Now we'll get to all the shit uh, off the air that, uh, oh, you, you, if only you heard the things we talk about. I always Thanks check for- the bottom, like, wait, are you sure it said isn't recording? No, yeah. don't worry. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. We'll talk next week about 1984 with, um, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. Eddie uh, Albert, uh, Lauren no, no, Green. No, I'm going for, I was going for Mr. Douglas and Mr. Cartwright. Ben Cartwright. Ben Cartwright, ben Cartwright and Oliver Douglas. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Our report details how advertising through television transforms strangers to your product into acquaintances and acquaintances into friends and friends into customers. You could almost say, as a result, that television puts into every living room a selling machine.